Today, I'm very excited to introduce our distinguished speakers. Dr. Vivek H. Murthy was confirmed by the US Senate in March 2021 to serve as the 21st Surgeon General of the United States as a returning role. As the nation's doctor, the Surgeon General's mission is to restore trust by relying on the best scientific information available, providing clear, consistent guidance and resources for the public, and ensuring that we reach our most vulnerable communities. As the Vice Admiral of the US Public Health Service Commissioned Corps, Dr. Murthy commands a uniform service of 6,000 dedicated public health officers serving the most underserved and vulnerable populations domestically and abroad. Sewell Chan joined the Texas Tribune as editor-in-chief in October 2021. A longtime journalist, he is passionate about news in service to democracy and human rights. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Is the mic too loud? Working well? Um, I have the distinguished pleasure of moderating this talk with someone that I have considered a dear friend for uh, 25 years now. Uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy um, and I met it at, at, un, as undergraduates at Harvard College. We actually liz, lived in the same dormitory, Quincy House, and I recognized in him even then really a special spark um, of someone who's not only supremely brilliant, but also very, very uh, empathetic and caring of others. And to see you rise, Vivek, and become the nation's doctor twice <laughs> has really been such a pleasure. Uh, so let's get started. Um, uh, I wanted to first ask you uh, about your research into loneliness, which you began after you left the Surgeon General's position the first time around. Your book on loneliness ended up coming out on April 28th of 2020. Quite some timing. Did you have any advance notice? <laughs> <laughs> I was not given advance notice of the pandemic, to be, to be clear. Um, but the reason actually, in interestingly, it was just a coincidence that it happened the book came out then. But I had started working on, on the book uh, about a year and change earlier, informed in part by the experiences I had when I was Surgeon General during the Obama administration. And it was a bit unexpected. Like if you had told me at the beginning of that tenure that I would be thinking about writing about loneliness, I would have said, that's eh, probably unlikely. Uh, but what happened, Sewell, is I, <clears throat> I saw in the, and heard in the stories of so many people I met around the country that they were in fact struggling with a deep sense of isolation, uh, with, with feeling lonely. And they didn't come out and say it outright uh, because there was a sense of shame that many people felt that to be lonely was to be broken in some way, to be socially deficient, uh, to be a loser, which is absolutely not the case, as it turns out. Uh, it turns out loneliness is a very common feature of just living life. It's a symptom of being human. But given the stigma around it, people didn't often talk about it in direct terms. They would talk about it indirectly. Um, but what it reminded me of, Sewell, were two things. One, the experiences I had with patients over the years, uh, seeing so many of them struggle with loneliness. and feeling helpless because it wasn't something I learned about in medical school. Uh, but it also reminded me of myself. You know, as a child, somebody who was incredibly shy, painfully shy at times, I had a hard time making friends in school. And you know, often I remember my mother taking me to school and dropping me off, and I just felt this sinking pit in my stomach because I didn't want to go to school because I was just like, I didn't want to walk into the, into the cafeteria and wonder who to sit next to. And I just felt this profound sense of loneliness. So, it took me a while to realize that I wasn't alone in feeling that way as a child, that so many people uh, struggle with loneliness. And that's true of a lot of adults. They don't realize that they're not the only ones struggling with loneliness. But that's what led me ultimately to, to write the book. And it turned out that the pandemic was a moment for many people to realize just, in fact, how common loneliness was. So I want to get into that in just a moment. But first, some vocabulary terms. How do you distinguish loneliness, isolation, and solitude? Uh, really good question. So loneliness is a subjective description of how you feel. And it's a, a feeling that people have when the connections they need in their life are greater than the connections they have. Uh, and that can happen even if you have hundreds and hundreds of friends on Facebook or followers on Instagram. Uh, it can happen even if you're surrounded by a lot of people in work or you know, at school. Um, because it's really about the quality relationships and how close you feel to those individuals. Uh, but it's also the case that people who only have a few friends may not feel lonely at all. Those are close friends with whom they can show up as themselves, with whom they can be uh, truly you know, open, transparent, and honest. 
So that is what loneliness is. Isolation is an objective description of how many people you tend to have around you. We may see that somebody who lives in a rural area miles and miles away from other people is physically isolated, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're lonely. And finally, solitude. Solitude is a state of welcome isolation, right? It's a, a time where we, for example, if you take some time during your day, five, 10 minutes, to listen to music that calms you, uh, to read something that inspires you, uh, to meditate, to pray, to spend time in nature, something that recenters you, that's time in solitude. It turns out it's incredibly important in our lives. We may all differ in how much solitude we need, uh, but we all need some solitude in our life. And it turns out that grounding that we do of ourselves enables us to better connect with other people because it enables us to be more comfortable with ourselves and in our own skin, which it turns out helps us uh, connect more deeply with others. When your book came out in the spring of 2020, obviously we were in kind of a maelstrom of um, a public health crisis. Your book actually gave me three very tangible pieces of advice that I applied during the last few years. Um, uh, strengthening connections, especially with people that, you know, getting back in touch, reaching back, reaching out, eliminating distractions, which I would argue is one of the hardest tasks that all of us face, and service to others. And I found that advice just so helpful. Um, and it's just good advice generally, but it especially strengthened me during the pandemic. Do you feel Americans were able to take advantage of that advice at a time when COVID meant, meant added so much more social and economic strain and, and you know, caused countless suffer deaths and, and suffering? You know, how, how do you feel America responded to the loneliness element of the pandemic? Well, it's, it's a really important question, and I think one that we, I think, haven't discussed enough as a country. We've talked about the number of people we've lost, and I hope we'll talk more about that today. Uh, we've talked about <clears throat> the economic impact of the pandemic. We've talked about the impact on the education of our kids. But the impact on loneliness and isolation is a, this is a profound cost, the one that we haven't come to grips with. I think for many people, the experience of the pandemic deepened their loneliness. For many people, it, um, it actually made them feel lonely perhaps for the first time uh, in a long time. And there are some group of people for whom the, the pandemic actually allowed them to strengthen their connections. These may be, have been individuals who were able to move to be closer uh, to extended family and they could actually live in an extended family household or live bubble with close friends and become even closer to them. But not everyone had that opportunity uh, or, or, or that luxury. And so I do think it was isolating for many people. My worry, Sewell, is uh, twofold. One is that that loneliness for many people still persists, and we haven't fully dealt with it. My second worry, though, is that we may not deal with it, is that we will snap back to the 2019 mentality and just say, OK, the pandemic's over. Let's just go back to doing what we were doing then. Whereas we know that after any trauma, and COVID-19 was a traumatic experience for our country, the world, and for us as individuals, you have to process what happened. We do this, for example, when we lose people in our life. We have ritual and we have reflection to allow us to understand what the meaning was in that experience, but to also understand and honor how we felt and to figure out how we move forward. And my worry is if we don't process that trauma, if we don't address this loneliness, that we will continue to struggle and suffer because we won't fill that hole that needs to be filled with meaningful relationships in our life, not just with our family and our friends, but with others in our community. Like during the pandemic, so I think many people uh, that I talked to had this experience of missing strangers. And what I mean by that is like so many times we walk into a coffee shop, right? We just see people around, maybe we work in the coffee shop and we're not necessarily talking to everyone, but it feels nice to sort of be around people. When we're walking down the street, we see somebody else walking the other way with their child or you know, a couple walking down the street. And we may not talk to them, but we appreciate maybe that they're there. And a lot of that vanished from people's lives. And so I think this appreciation both for uh, close ties and loose ties uh, was something that people, it was in people's consciousness, but I worry that we will not recognize and build on that experience to actually create more connected lives. Yeah, that concept of missing strangers may explain why also so many people have come out to South by this year, yeah. the first time in person <laughs> since 2019. That's right. And I'll give a hand for that. <laughs> Vivek, we are closing in on a million deaths from COVID in the United States, which is an unspeakable tragedy. 
Many of us have participated in moments of silence, prayer vigils, sending cards and flowers to people who've lost loved ones. But what could we collectively do to kind of mark the loss and the grief? Is that something that we need to do? How would that even come about? I do think it's something we need to do. I mean, it's like two, three years ago, if you had said, this event is gonna take place, that's gonna cost us a million lives, that would have taken our breath away. And it should. This is more than the number of people we lost in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. This is, we have lost more people in a single day during this pandemic at times than we lost during the entire 9-11 tragedy. I mean, this scale and scope of loss is, is breathtaking and, and it sometimes defies our ability to comprehend and process. But that's exactly why we need to put effort toward memorializing those we lost and processing that moment. One way that we can do that, I think, is to look to how we've done it in the past, right? With 9-11, this is an example. We created a memorial in New York City, one that people visit uh, many every day that reminds them of what we lost, that reminds us that we have to recommit to our highest ideals. So physical memorials help, but we also, on the anniversary of 9-11, use that as an opportunity to remember the stories of those who were lost, to mourn in our own way. Um, these are all things that we do collectively as a society to make sure that we don't forget those who were lost, but also to make sure that we are constantly reminded of the values uh, that their loss should remind us of, values around looking out for one another, recognizing that in a pandemic, you can't just look out for yourself. The only way we get through a pandemic is by pulling together, by looking out for one another. Um, and there also, there's a, an important value around investing in the future as well. Like if we only live for today, if we don't invest in building better systems for tomorrow, we won't be prepared for the next pandemic. And I think the, the third value I'll just mention of the many uh, is the value of human connection, what we started this conversation with. You know, it turns out when we talk about pandemic preparedness, when we think about the next pathogen, the next virus that may come and how we prepare for it. We talk a lot about how we make sure we have the ability to develop a new vaccine, new therapeutics, develop tests that will respond and be able to detect the next pathogen and all of these uh, you know, sort of physical and structural processes. What we don't talk about often enough is what I think of as one of the most important planks of pandemic preparedness, and that is the strength of our social fabric in communities. And we saw the, the consequences of not having strong social fabric in this pandemic, we saw that when people aren't connected to one another, that they fall through. Uh, and they often, when they get sick, they may not be people to help them, right? Mayor Tom Tate, a former mayor of Anaheim, California, uh, a great leader and a good friend, uh, said to me something I'll never forget. He said that when you're in an emergency, a fire, an earthquake, uh, you're, you're something else, like a, a flash flood, even before the police get there, or the fire person I'll get there, first people on the scene are actually your neighbors. They're there. And if you know them, then you have a much stronger support system than if you don't know them. And so I think that if we wanna be better prepared for the next pandemic, we need to build, rebuild that social fabric. Cause it's not just to have people there to help you. It's about how you share and disseminate accurate information. We know that misinformation has been so abundant and has spread so quickly with the speed, sophistication, uh, you know, and scale really that we've never seen before. Um, but we also know that the people who, for example, change their mind about important facts about COVID-19 from believing in myths to believing in science-based facts, that when asked, why did you change their mind, your mind? What they often said is it was talking to a family member, talking to a friend, or talking to a healthcare provider they knew and trusted. Right? So it is our relationships that actually protect us, that immunize us, in a sense, uh, from some of the harms that may come from a pandemic. So let's stay on trust for a moment. Um, I think one thing that frustrated so many during the pandemic was a seeming loss of confidence in experts in science. You know, you came on, of course, this year. You've had to help re rebuild and restore you know, trust in science communications. Obviously, you're one of the most prominent faces of the Biden administration's pandemic response. How 
do how have you tried to approach the the challenge of of reestablishing trust when it's been so eroded? This is a really important question, and it's a really tough one. Like we know that even before the pandemic, trust was eroding, right, in large institutions, including in government. And the pandemic, I think, large institutions and in science have, and public health have taken a hit in terms of public trust. I think about rebuilding trust in institutions the way I think about rebuilding trust between individuals, which is that you've got to start by listening uh, to people and understanding where they are coming from, what their experiences are. You can't just assume, for example, that just because somebody declines a vaccine that they are an anti-vaccine person or that they don't believe in science. Right? They may have had a bad experience. They may uh, have hurt a friend who had a side effect and they're worried about that. The second thing is you've got to be open and honest with how you communicate with people. And that includes saying when you don't know the answer uh, to things. Nobody, in a pandemic, one of the things I've noticed is that uh, from experts there's often a desire to want to be confident and certain, right? Because they believe during a time of uncertainty, you've got to project confidence, clarity, and surety. And that's how you get people to a good place to feel like, okay, now I don't need to worry anymore. But there's a fine line there. Something I learned in doctoring was that Yes, you want your patients to feel confident in the care they're getting, but that doesn't mean that you should provide false confidence. It doesn't mean that you should pretend you know the diagnosis when you're unsure or that you're 100% sure the treatment is gonna have the outcome that they want, even though you're not 100% sure that it will. Um, so you've gotta be honest and, and about what you know and what you don't know. And then the last thing I would say is that you've also gotta to continue to show up. You have to communicate often um, you have to go to where people are and not just expect them to come to you. And that means not just, for example, going on cable TV, right, to talk to the public, um, although that's one channel. That means recognizing that people show up in different places. Not everyone's watching cable TV, right? Uh, some people don't have a subscription to cable TV. That would be me. Uh, so, you know, you have to show up where people are and, and you've got to do so, again, with a willingness to listen and to be honest. So, the way, and, and there's one last thing to mention, which is, and this is very important for institutions in particular, which is that you have to deliver what you say you're going to deliver, which means you have to keep your promises, which the corollary to that is don't make promises you can't keep, right? Uh, now, this is very, very difficult, right? Because in the midst of a, and again, to analogize this to, to patient care, when you have a patient who's in crisis and their family is looking to you and saying, okay, you have a new diagnosis of, of cancer, can you save them? Can you, can you tell me for sure that they're gonna be okay, that you can cure this? There is every pressure in the world in that moment to say, yes, don't worry. We're gonna take care of this 100%, we're gonna be fine. But that is a short-term Band-Aid that will lead to greater problems later because if you can't deliver on that, then that tells the, the individual that, wow, it wasn't just that my doctor wasn't honest with me, the healthcare system's not being honest with me. Maybe I can't trust other doctors and nurses in the system. So it's very, this is one of the toughest tasks. Like when you're in the midst of a crisis, you wanna overpromise. But it's important to be measured, to be thoughtful in what you promise, but then to work like hell to deliver on what you promise. These are the ways in which, through which you build trust. These aren't easy, they take time. Uh, and that's why I think it's, it's so tough to do, but it's more important now than ever before. Vivek, something about, there's no binaries, right? Social media has been able to connect some people and perhaps reduce loneliness. Mm. Unfortunately, also in some ways that may have exacerbated loneliness for some, and certainly it's been a source of misinformation. You know, is, is social media partly to blame for the crisis of loneliness we have in our country? I know for a fact that when, after this talk, you know, the first thing I'll do after saying goodbye to you will be checking my phone. Uh, we've all been in elevators, elevator cars where everyone's checking their phone. Sadly, many of us have been at family dinners where everyone is checking their phone. I see a gentleman in the audience right now checking his phone. <laughs> I'm, I'm not blaming you. It's no, no, this, is not a, this is not a space of judgment. You know, it, did the screens make it harder for us to build trust and form connection? Well, let me do this. Just since we've got a lot of folks here, let me just ask you, just by a show of hands, how many people here feel like you use your phone more than you want to? Okay. <laughs> I'm having a hard time seeing if there are any hands not up. I think just a few. Um, I feel the same way. And I would venture to say that the vast, vast majority of users of smartphones and social media feel the same way too. Now, I think at the end of the day, technology is a tool. It can be used to help us or to hurt us, right? 
undeniably, there are great benefits uh, that we have, convenience, connection, and even when it comes to connection itself, you know, you, uh, I've been able to reconnect with old friends through social media. I've been able to stay more closely connected uh, to friends because we have text threats, you know, through which we keep each other updated. These are all like, wonderful and positive. But like anything, technology is not an unmitigated good, right? And if we don't draw boundaries around it and recognize what kind of uses are helpful versus harmful, then it can really impact our mental health and our connection to other people. So I'll give you a simple example. Um, the last few nights, like my, my wife and I, after we put our kids to bed, and they sleep in separate rooms, so our kids, so we put them into bed in one room and then in another room, and they have to fall asleep with us uh, there, otherwise they just won't work. And so my wife and I are often texting each other as our kids are falling asleep, what are you doing, what are you doing, da, da, da. And it turns out ever since the Ukraine, uh, you know, just the horrific situation in Ukraine happened, what I think it really is, the war crimes in Ukraine, ever since that began, my wife and I have just been following the news so closely, and my wife will be texting me, you know, in the middle of our kids falling asleep, me like, I'm doom scrolling. I can't get off this thing. What do I do? I need to stop reading Twitter. I need to stop reading the news. This is, I, I can't do this anymore. But then half an hour later, I'll be like, hey, where are you? She'll be like, I'm still scrolling, you know? And I have the same experience. You know, I'm doing the same thing. Now, that's an example of where not setting boundaries has been not good for me and not good for my wife, right? And so now we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we check but not like be you know, constantly like have, have our head in the news? <clears throat> the other point that, that Sewell mentioned is also important. It's not just setting boundaries around how much time you use uh, our devices, but setting boundaries around where we use our devices, right? So like I've noticed that like when I bring my device uh, to bed with me, and I'm like to the very last moment, you know, like you know, scro scrolling through stuff, and then I fall asleep with my. Uh, I see people nudging the folks on their on, on, on the right next to them. Like we all do this, I know at times. But when I do that, I feel like actually I don't sleep as well as when as uh, compared to when I put my phone aside like a half hour before I go to sleep, and I just sleep, you know, more. I end up sleeping more restfully. Um, the dining table is another great example. I am embarrassed to say that there are many occasions where I have been, you know, I've had my phone next to me being like, I'm not going to use it during dinner time. And then somehow it creeps into my hand. I don't know how that happens. And then somehow it unlocks itself. I don't know how that happens. And then lo and behold, I'm scrolling through stuff. Meanwhile, my son and daughter are like looking at me. They're four and five, by the way. Uh -huh. And they're like, well, where's Papa? Why is he, what's he doing? Um, and I feel terrible about that. And I feel embarrassed about that. But I've done that, right? And so one of the commitments that I made a few years ago was that I was going to try to focus more on my kids and more on family when I'm with them and try to put the phones aside more. So wherever we draw boundaries, we have to draw boundaries. You know, it might mean that we have certain times in our day that we don't use our devices, certain spaces at the dinner table or where we don't use our devices. Or it might also be that we choose to not use our devices when we're having conversations with other people, right? And as silly as that sounds, I can't tell you how many times in the past I've been on the phone catching up with a friend, and on the side, somehow I'm scrolling through sports scores and looking at social media and looking at the news in my inbox, and, and I convince myself the whole time that I can multitask, right? And that's a great lie that we tell ourselves when it comes to technology, mm -hmm. that we can multitask. But the science is very clear. We don't multitask, we rapidly task switch. Yeah. So that means that even if I can recall the words Sewell said, because sometimes we'll do that, but no, 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 I'm listening. You just said this, 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 and this. What we miss is the nuance behind that. We miss connecting the dots between what they just said and what they said before. We miss the emotion in their voice. Um, so I do think that we have to draw those boundaries. And, and the tough part about this, Sewell, is that in some ways there's a giant national experiment that is being conducted like on our, the population uh, when it comes to technology, and including on our children when it comes to social media. And this is one of the reasons why recently uh, I actually issued a public request for information to the broader public, but also to technology companies, uh, building on a, uh, a Surgeon General's advisory I issued over the last summer, uh, asking them to put forth information that would help us understand the impact of social media on uh, the population more broadly. Our request for information centered around misinformation, trying to understand the impact that social media platforms have on misinformation. But we've also asked them, and a, a mental health advisor I issued, to also share that data among the impact on kids. Because the truth is, if, if anybody, if, I, if somebody was conducting a clinical trial uh, on, on, on a, a medication, and even before the trial was done, the results were known, they said, you know what, just go ahead and take it. 
it's all right, just, just take it. It's no big deal. And in fact, we'll make it really easy to take. And it turned out it was actually felt kind of addictive as well. Uh, and so everyone was taking it, you know, and taking it at a you know, greater, greater succession frequency, et cetera. Like, is there any world in which we would think that was okay? Like, no, we would say, can you at least tell us what your data says about how it's impacting us? But in a way, we haven't done that when it comes to technology. And when I think about my kids, they're four and five, they don't have a, well, they don't have their own phones yet, but they somehow <laughs> seem to acquire my phone and my wife's phone quite often. Um, but when I think about my kids and other kids, I wanna know what the impact is. Not to say that they'll never use tech, but so I can make thoughtful, informed decisions about how to safely engage my kids with technology. So there's a lot we can do at the individual and even community level, but what can we do structurally? I mean, loneliness kills. I think I, I'm, for those who haven't read the book yet, it, the statistics were astonishing how loneliness relates to the opioid crisis, the rise in suicides, even the accident rates, and certainly uh, chronic conditions like heart disease uh, and diabetes. Loneliness plays a role in outcomes. What should be happening at the governmental level? What can businesses do? What can universities do? How do we not, as, a, as an economy, just revert to 2019? Yeah, so this is, I think, the, the exact right question for, for this moment. And, and, and just to underscore what Sewell said at the beginning, loneliness is bad for our health. That it's associated with an increased risk of anxiety and depression, premature death, heart disease, dementia, sleep disturbances, the list goes on. And there are biological reasons for that that we can talk about uh, if you're all interested. But to address it, we need action on multiple levels, on government level, institutional level, and individual level. What the government can do here, uh, and government can't solve loneliness, it can't force people to connect, but what government can do is they can identify an issue like this as a national priority and rebuilding social connection in our country is and should be a national priority. Uh, it can also invest in research and understanding what strategies work to strengthen connection, and it can help build a national strategy for us in a way that the private sector cannot do alone. What institutions can do uh, is also very powerful. Workplaces, I believe, can be engines of community and connection, right? But we have to design them that way, right? We have to create opportunities for people to get to know each other and deepen their understanding of one another. And it turns out, and this is one of the things I learned as I was uh, doing research on the topic, was that you know, when you just push people into a room for a happy hour and say, go forth and connect, it doesn't always happen, right? And you know, some people connect here and there, but when you have the, the family, the, the company picnic, right, uh, on a weekend, uh, well intended, but a lot of times also not so easy for people to connect and it takes time away from their family and from work. The, the challenge is how do you create opportunities using existing time, using a little bit of structure uh, to create real connection in the workplace? I'll tell you something that we do in our office. We have something uh, this time around called our Humans of OSG. OSG stands for Office of the Surgeon General. And it's something that it was a, a grassroots uh, initiative that our team developed. Uh, in fact, Serena, who is one of our team members, is here who helped create that initiative. Um, and Ann Kim is as well. But what people will do is every week, we, when we have our all staff meeting, we choose two people, one to be the interviewer and the interviewee, right? And we spend 15 minutes uh, where uh, one person will just ask the other person questions about their life. It might be about you know, their, their parents, about growing up, about hobbies, about aspirations, about dreams, about disappointments. I will tell you, it takes 15 minutes once a week and I'll tell you that every workplace is 15 minutes in a week. But in that 15 minutes, we get to know so much about that person and feel so deeply connected to them in a way that we wouldn't have if we had just been working side by side for several months. That's become rapidly everyone's favorite part uh, of that meeting and largely of the week. We really look forward to, to that moment. Do, do you have staffers who are hesitant to be open and vulnerable even for that short period of time? So that's a really good question. And so what we do is we make sure that the interviewer and the interviewee have a chance to chat beforehand so they can figure out what they're comfortable with. Because we don't want people to share what they're not comfortable with. But it turns out, even when people just limit their sharing to what they're comfortable with, that amount of openness can be transformative. So at an institutional level, we can create workplaces that f foster human connection. We can invest in the kind of uh, programs in schools 
uh, that help our children develop the foundations for creating healthy relationships from an early age. We assume that kids just pick that up from their families. It's not the case. Many adults, many parents didn't have, don't have the tools for how to build healthy relationships because they were never taught that. That wasn't modeled for them. Uh, so we can't assume uh, that this is what our kids will get from the community. Uh, to me, building healthy relationships, the skills of doing that is as important as reading or writing. It is a fundamental life skill. The last thing, though, um, Sewell, is at the individual level. Like, what can we do there? And this is where I think we have a fundamental choice that we have to make as individuals, as a society, which is a choice about what kind of society we want to live in. Do we want to live in a society where relationships truly do matter, where everyone's life does, in fact, have value, where we seek to protect one another, where we recognize that we're not just 330 million people who happen to live in the same landmass, but we're an actual community. We're a country of people who care about each other, who have each other's backs, and who will fight for one another and defend one another. Are we that? Or are we a society where what really matters is your work and how much power you acquire, how much wealth you can accumulate, how much fame uh, you can build? Because those three elements, I worry right now, are the dominant narrative about what constitutes success. Right? Every parent out there wants their children to be successful. But when you dig into what constitutes success, um, that's where it gets a little bit more murky. And in fact, there were some researchers from the Harvard Graduate School of Education who did, did, in fact did this. They asked kids uh, in a very large survey what was most important to their parents. Was it for the kids uh, to be kind, to be happy, or to be successful? And I'll tell you, kindness did not do well in that survey. Was the, healthy an option? Healthy was not an option, that is a good question, of those three. But the kids, the majority of them thought that being successful was really what their parents wanted for them, even much more so than being kind. When you talk to the parents, no parent would say, I don't want my kid to be kind. Right. Every parent wants their child to be kind. So this isn't a question of like where, what are our values, it's a question of what do we prioritize in our values. And that's where I think we have a fundamental decision to make. And our life looks different if we center our lives and society around people. The choices we make about where we spend our time, attention, and energy are different. The choices we make potentially about where we choose to live, about what jobs we take may be different. Uh, the choices we make about whether we spend our weekends working or with friends and family may be different. Um, so ultimately, as much as institutions and government matter, it's what we do at an institutional, at an individual level that ultimately shifts culture. And culture is what drives change fundamentally, right? There's no policy change that can be sustained if the cultural support for it doesn't exist. If the government puts processes in place, institutions, uh, workplaces develop connection programs, but people don't fundamentally think that that matters or that they want to build their lives around it, then those programs aren't sustainable. So that's why I think this is a moment, especially as we've come through two years of this pandemic, experienced extraordinary loss and deep loneliness, where we have to make this fundamental decision and it has to be a decision. We, can't, we won't just fall into it. It won't just be the case that we develop greater connection. Uh, we will go back to 2019 with all its gifts and flaws uh, if we don't actively make the decision that we want to build in our lives and in our communities greater connection. You've written a lot in your book about um, patients that you've seen, people with chronic illness, people in chronic pain, and yes, people at the end of their lives. What have you learned from these patients and how has that shaped your research and advocacy on, on, on this issue? Well, you know, I always go back to the stories of the patients I cared for because I, I was taught in medical school by one of my professors, August Fortin, uh, that if you, he, he said this, he said, if you let them, your patients will be your greatest teachers. That's what he always used to say. If you let them, that was always the qualifier, right? And I came over time to realize that he was right, but I also realized that I had to listen, right? I had to not just rush out of there after taking a quick history and, and putting the orders in. Um, but what I've learned from patients over the years uh, is not just about how common loneliness is, it's also about what constitutes a meaningful life, right? And I, I think about the patients, for example, who I cared for toward the end of their lives. Uh, 
the patients who, in those final moments where I was blessed enough to have the opportunity to be by their side, in some cases holding their hand, listening to those reflections, to think about what they said. And none of them talked about how many followers they had on Instagram. Like, n nobody talked about the corner office that they secured, how much money they had in their bank account, the promotion that they worked all their life to get. Almost to a T, what they talked about, whether they were old or young, at the end of the life, what they talked about were their relationships. They talked about the people they loved, the people they were gonna miss, the people who had broken their heart, the people they wished they had spent more time with. What is so, there's something clarifying about those final moments in life. And what they consistently tell us is that our relationships matter. But we don't have to wait until the end of life to come to that realization. We have the opportunity to build our lives around people right now. And when I think about my children, uh, and my children inform so much of my work and my worldview these days, but I think like any other parent, how do I make sure that they are happy and fulfilled in their lives? And despite being the overprotective parent that I am, I know I can't always be there to ensure that that happens. I know that they're gonna rely on people in the community lifting them up when they fall down, forgiving them when they make a mistake, pausing to listen to them before they judge them. Those are the things I hope all of us will have, that all of our children will have. But today, that's not guaranteed, right? We live in a world where it's too easy to be mean to people, where we can, in the faceless sort of world of social media, hurl insults at one another with seemingly little consequence to ourselves and little knowledge of the impact it's having on other people. But that is not real life. We often wouldn't do that to somebody, like face to face. And so part of this is about how do we use this moment and this opportunity to recenter ourselves around the values that we want us to live by, but that we also want for our children. And to me, this is fundamentally uh, about a question of, uh, about love and fear. This is about do we want to build a world that's centered around love? Or do we want to allow fear to drive anger and resentment and mistrust and so much of what we see uh, surrounding us in the world today? And lastly, say, say this. I, I use the word love very intentionally here because we have somehow, some way in society convinced ourselves that love is soft and weak, right? How many boys or your men do you know who would be comfortable talking uh, about how they want to be a beacon for love in their community, right? Not so many, not enough. Um, but what we've learned, if, and what I've seen so clearly in the lives of my patients, is that love is the greatest force that we have. It's what enables a parent to do the unimaginable and put themselves in harm's way for their child because they love them. It's what allows a soldier in the throes of battle to jump in harm's way to save the fellow soldier next to them. That's a deep bond of love. The greatest things that we do in our life, we do because of love. There is no greater motivator. There's no greater force. And so the question we have to grapple with is how do we reflect that in our lives? Because our love manifests as kindness, as compassion, as generosity. We feel good when we both give it and when we receive it. And I hope and I want that to be the yardstick for how we measure worth. Not how much I was able to acquire, but how much was I able to give and receive love. And that's something we all have the ability to do from the day we're born. And if you doubt that, look at small children. Look at how they behave, right? Over time, they learn to be mistrustful, to hold back, to not be themselves, to be cautious about being too loving in case it's not reciprocated. But that's not how they are born. And so part of our journey going forward is not a journey to transform ourselves into something we're not. We're on a journey to return to who we fundamentally are, beings who are grounded and powered by love, beings who are stronger and better when we are together. And we still have the ability to do that. I have faith because of what I've seen. Vivek, I wish you were not only America's doctor, but also our spiritual advisor. <laughs> Let's turn to some questions, if you don't mind. Um, 
I have completely tried to avoid um, political questions, but one of our audience members asks a really legitimate question, really interesting one. Does the loneliness, is the loneliness creating more polarization and hyperpolarization, or is it that the polarization is creating more loneliness? Well, that's a really good question. So I think polarization is very linked uh, to, to, to the issue of loneliness and isolation. Um, it turns out it's also linked to misinformation, uh, that in polarized environments, misinformation spreads more easily. Uh, but I think one of the things that happens when you're lonely is that it can become a downward spiral. The lonelier you are, the more you feel uh, doubts about whether anybody would even want to connect with you. And then you push people away exactly at a time when you need other people. That can be profoundly difficult because, and it could also involve a lot of anger. The same time that you're pushing people away, you can be angry at the world for leaving you alone, for making you feel so isolated. And that anger can in fact feed and fuel uh, deeper polarization. So part of what we have to do, and, and part of what our journey to create greater connection is about, uh, is also helping to address that deeper well of polarization. Um, because polarization thrives when people don't trust each other. Uh, polarization thrives when people feel like they are not seen, when they're not understood. And fundamentally, I believe that we all have a desire to feel seen for who we are, to know that we matter, and to be loved. So three fundamental needs that we all have. And when we meet those needs, we close off so much of the, the fuel uh, that has lit this fire of polarization that is really burning and destroying our country and really other countries around the world. Um, so yes, so it starts with the connection we build in our lives, but it also, what matters here is the connection we build with people who lead lives that are different from us. Right, because one of the things that's happened, interestingly, in this hyper-connected world that we live in, is it's become easier to connect with people who are like us, either in terms of background, similar thoughts, uh, life experiences, and harder to connect with people who have different experiences. And the truth is, if we want to be an equitable society, we have to be able to advocate for all of us. We have to, but we, as human beings, it's easier for us to advocate for people who we know. So the question is, how do we get to know one another better as a country? Now, there are certain institutions like the military, which create opportunities for people of different backgrounds to come together, to serve together, uh, and to get to know one another uh, better. But we need more spaces and opportunities like that. Uh, it's one of the reasons I think that the idea of having uh, non-military service you know, as part of our lives uh, is, is also very important and could be profoundly helpful when it comes to bringing people together with different backgrounds to learn about one another. Would you make that compulsory? That's a good question. Um, I certainly think you could make the argument too, uh, make it compulsory. And I think that's a conversation and debate we should have as a country. The question would be, should an 18-year-old after they graduate spend a year serving their country in a community that's different from theirs? You know, maybe in an inner city in the Midwest, maybe somewhere else uh, in the country, maybe in an urban or rural area. Or a farm. Or a farm, right. I think we would have a lot to gain if people served the country in that way. I think it would fundamentally change the trajectory of many young people's lives uh, to have that experience. Uh, and I think we would build stronger bonds between uh, our people. Um, another question. Um, what about the relationship between loneliness and big business and economics? Um, one of our colleagues asks, people who sell things benefit from us each being isolated consumers, buying our own stuff. <laughs> what do you make of that? Well, you know, when it comes to, to business, I think what I would really like to see are, on, are a generation of entrepreneurs that use business and use technology in particular to strengthen our community and connection. We can do that, right? Even though we have many technologies that separate us, perhaps, uh, that focus on trying to sell us as much as possible, um, through as many channels as possible, I do think that business can be forced for good. And I say that as somebody who spent uh, seven years building a technology company, and it was one of the great experiences of my life, and I hope we were able to do a lot of good through it. But I do think it requires entrepreneurs who are willing to lead with their values who are willing to 
design the outcome that they want as not just uh, a certain profit target, but also a target when it comes to social good delivered, right? And in this case, we need to use and harness the power of technology to connect us more deeply, to help us get to know the stories and experiences of people uh, who are different from ours. It's why I actually think that when it comes to media, that print media uh, and like you know, sort of you know video digital media, media has a really important role to play here too. Because when, at their best, uh, I think our, our media can help tell our stories, uh, the stories that aren't easily heard, right? But that has to be a clear and present goal, right? And this is where business also interests can be a challenge as well, right? When my business model is built on how many clicks I can get for an article versus how honestly I can tell a story or how balanced you know, I, I can share you know, like a, a, you know, or, I, or you know, discuss a particular issue, then we have a fundamental problem. And I've spoken to, to folks in the media, in entertainment uh, as well, who behind closed doors will lament the fact that the business model is driven by something that feels and often is counter to the social good, which is driving up clicks, which is often best done by stoking anxiety, uh, stoking fear, stoking mistrust, and stoking controversy. Right? So I think to do this, though, to center our business uh, sort of enterprise, whether it's around technology or media, around the social good has to be an active decision. Uh, will there be pain points there along the way? Yes. Transitioning from one revenue model to another is never easy. From one business model to another is never simple. Uh, we had to do that multiple times when I was building my company, and it was painful every time. But at the end of the day, like, what, are, what is our goal? Like, what are we trying to do? What do we think will create the greatest well-being and happiness and fulfillment in life? It is not, as my patients have told me over the years and many have realized, it is not ultimately the size of our bank accounts. It's not to say that we can't make money, that we can't do well financially, but it's to say that there are other metrics that should matter just as much, and social good is one of those. Well, speaking of the media, Vivek, you, uh, I did not put you up to this, but you have uh, indirectly made the case for the nonprofit, nonpartisan, fact-based, and member-supported journalism done by nonprofit newsrooms like the Texas Tribune. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to reframe one of these questions here. Um, it's January of 2023, and uh, President Biden finally has a little bit more bandwidth. <laughs> And he uses his State of the Union to announce a war on loneliness, uh, a national strategy to combat loneliness and social isolation. What would that look like? Hmm. Um, and I will say he does actually care about the issue of loneliness. Uh, it was one of the first things he and I spoke about several years ago, long before he ran for, uh, for, for president. Um, and something we talked about often uh, in 2020 during the first year of the pandemic. Uh, but what would it look like? A national campaign to address loneliness would look like a couple things. Number one, it would look like developing a national strategy to address social connection and community in partnership with faith organizations, with civic organizations, with public health and medical organizations, with educators and other stakeholders. The second thing that it would look like would be a financial investment that we made in research, in understanding what is driving loneliness. Is it tech? Is it other factors? And what are the solutions that actually work? Uh, the third thing that it would involve would be an, an examination, and I would say an evaluation metric for policy that wasn't, so policies are often evaluated on their financial impact. How many dollars and cents does it cost uh, to implement policy X? We don't often think about the social cost of policies. When we built highways that chopped up cities and separated communities, that had a powerful impact on our communities that we didn't really factor in when we were designing those policies. Same could be said with housing policy, with labor policy. Um, and finally, what it would look like, I think, is a real call to action to communities around the country, recognizing that the government alone doesn't solve loneliness, but the government can be a catalyst. It can lay out a vision. It can bring people together. It can set benchmarks and goals so that we can both measure our progress and hold ourselves accountable to make that progress. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I believe that it is our connection with one another that is the foundation on which we build everything else. 
And if you think about your own life experience, we all kind of know this, right? The times in our life where maybe we were really successful by work standards, where we seemingly had a lot of friends just because we were going to parties all the time, but where we didn't really feel like there were people in our life who really got us, who understood us, who had our back, those moments didn't really feel great, right? But I know plenty of people who are wealthy, who are powerful, who are you know, famous, but who are profoundly unhappy. I also know people, plenty of people, who have none of those three attributes, but have friends who love them, with whom they can truly be themselves. And these people are deeply, deeply fulfilled. The people my father grew up with in his small village, where people lived in deep poverty. I mean, not enough food to put around the table at night, no money to buy slippers. My father got a blister on his foot when he was 15 years old when he wore slippers for the first time because he had never worn them before. His feet didn't know what that was like. But they were happy. And I don't want to romanticize poverty. There's nothing to be sought after when it comes to poverty. And sure, they would have liked more resources. Sure, he and his siblings and his father would have liked more food around the table. What I mean to say is, even though they're financially poor, they didn't feel relationally poor. They felt like they were people they could rely on. When my father's mother died, there was a network of people who stood up to help support him, his five siblings, and his father. Um, so that's, I think, what we have to just remember is that our connections are one of our greatest assets and one of our greatest sources of value. And the question that government, that institutions and individuals have to ask ourselves is how are we gonna invest in our relationships now? How are we gonna build a truly people-centered life and a people-centered society? We have time for one more question. Retirement homes were severely impacted by COVID. And of course, we're an aging society. More and more people will be living in assisted living, um, skilled nursing facilities, et cetera. Residents were painfully isolated from their families. What lessons have we learned from that experience? Well, one of the big things we learned, Sewell, is that we have to understand the full benefits and costs of the public health measures that we take, right? I think about the patients who died during the pandemic, whose families weren't even allowed to come and see them who had to say goodbye to them through FaceTime. I, I can't even begin to imagine what that feels like. I mean, it just, it's, it's crushing to, to imagine the, the pain of not being able to say goodbye to your loved one when you know that they're right there inside a building. I understand why those measures were taken and I don't fault the hospitals that put those measures in place. We were all operating at a time where we were just learning about this virus. We didn't know how bad it could get. It was getting worse and worse. People did the best they could. But one of the things we've learned from this experience, though, is that we have to find ways to allow people to stay connected to their families, even in the midst of a terrible pandemic like this. Um, that not only means that we need to make better use of technology, and particularly folks who are older often aren't as facile with technology, so often just having an iPad at their bedside doesn't mean that they can connect. But we also have to just weigh more clearly the costs of isolation um, because there is a cost and we have to be honest about that. You know, I'll ask you to say, you know, I know we've spent a lot of time today talking about uh, human connection. And I think one of the hardest things I find when it comes to human connection is recognizing how much of it we may actually already have in our lives. When I was served as Surgeon General during the Obama administration, it was an extraordinary opportunity and I'm so grateful for that time to serve. But it was a time where I felt quite lonely because I had made this decision to just pour everything into work. I was like, I don't know how long I'll have to do this job. It turned out I didn't have that long. Um, <laughs> I don't know, uh, you know what'll come up. I need to do as much as I can each day even if it comes at a cost of not seeing family, not talking to friends, letting my work invade dinner time and all other facets of my life. In retrospect, that was a mistake. But I came out of my time as Surgeon General feeling profoundly alone and not having the work community that I had. And those were some very dark days when I was processing everything that I had been through, but also just feeling like I had no community anymore. 
And I remember sitting down with a friend at that time who said to me, Vivek, your problem is not that you don't have friendships. It's that you're not experiencing friendships. Your friends are there. They still love you. Yeah, they might be pissed that you didn't return their call three months ago. But they still love you. They still care about you. You just need to experience those friendships. And so I thought a lot about that. Uh, I started reaching out more to those friends. I formed something called the Moai, which is an Okinawan tradition where a small group of people at a young age come together and commit to being there for one another. I decided to do that with two other friends, dear friends who I just never saw very often, even though we always you know, deeply loved each other. And we made a commitment to video conference once a month for two hours mm. to talk about the things friends don't talk about often enough, our relationships, our health, our finances, our fears. And I also made it a point to just try to feel like the warmth of the people in my life, even if I wasn't physically around them. And I wanted to just, in the last minute that we have here, just do that exercise that I sometimes do with you, right? So if you take your right hand, just hold it up. And I just put it gently on your heart. And then close your eyes. For the next 10 seconds, I want you to think about the people in your life who have been there for you over the years, people who have supported you during difficult times, the people who have reassured you during moments where you doubted yourself, the people who have been there to celebrate with you, people who have always showed up. you to think about the love that they have had for you over the years. I want you to feel that love flowing through you, lifting you up, strengthening you, reminding you that you are seen, that you matter, and that you are loved. And remember that that love it's always with you, even if they're not with you, because it will always be in your heart. Now open your eyes. So what you felt in those 10 seconds was just the calming and extraordinary power of love. It's what our relationships can give us. It's a great gift that we are all born with, the ability to give and to receive that love. And sometimes we have to remember it. But moments like this remind me that sometimes it only takes 10 seconds to remember what truly makes life worth living and to remember that we often have more of it in our lives than we may realize. Vivek, this has been a truly profound hour uh, I am so privileged to be one of the friends who has remained connected to you. And I want to thank you on behalf of this audience for your wisdom, your insights, and your time. Thank you.